Hey, BookTube. Uh, thanks for joining me again. Welcome back to part two of the last book haul uh, of 2021. Um, the last uh, video, if you carry over from the first part, we left off on a really nice hardcover edition of Salman Rushdie's The Satanic Verses, which will go nicely with the um, this book I showed in part one, the Salman Rushdie's Imaginary Homelands. It's a book of his essays from 81 to 91. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that, including his new, well, new, he wrote it in 91 to mark the three-year anniversary of the fatwa. Um, so that'll be interesting. Uh, so now we got this little final stack here, so although it's not little. <laughs> We've got a mixture of history um, and a little bit of literature. So let's go back to literature for a second. Uh, for you fans of... Um, and I think I have a folio edition of Maria Var Vargas Losa's work, that, that big book he wrote, which was, uh, oh, I can't see it right now, but I have a folio society edition. It was a, the, something at the end of the world or the end of the world. Anyway, I found this book. Again, I love essays, but these are essays by Maria Varga Vargas Losa. It's called Sabres and Utopias, Visions of Latin America, Essays, and a beautiful Picador edition. Don't you love Picador edition books? Uh, look at that. Oh, I love the cover. Sabres and Utopias, with a sword turning into a palm tree with uh, looks like bananas and some other fruit here. Anyway, it's translated by Anna Kushner, so let me read this to you. Um, throughout his career, the Nobel Prize winner Maria Vargas Llosa has grappled with the concept of Latin America on a global stage. Examining liberal claims and searching for cohesion, he continuously weighs the reality of the continent against the image, of, the image it projects and considers the political dangers and possibilities that face this diverse set of countries. Now this illuminating and versatile collection assembles these never-before-translated criticisms and meditations. Reflecting the intellectual development of the writer himself, these essays distill the great events of Latin America's recent history, analyze political groups like FARC and Sendero Luminoso, and evaluate the legacies of infamous leaders such as Papa Doc Duvalier and Fidel Castro. Arranged by theme, they trace Vargas Losa's unwavering demand for freedom, his embrace of and disenchantment with revolutions, and his critique of nationalism, populism, indigenism, and corruption. From the discovery of liberal ideas to a defense of democracy, buoyed by a passionate invocation of Latin American literature and art, Sabres and Utopias is a monumental collection from one of our most important writers. Um, so, sign me up. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. Um, a lot of history involved, too, in these essays. So, you know, it's it's written by a writer, you know, an author known to be, you know, very literary, but um, uh, I look forward to seeing what they say about his, his embrace of and disenchantment with revolutions um, and a critique of indigenism, which is interesting. Uh, if I'm reading that correctly, that means he's like, uh, probably has some words of caution about just, you know, going whole, whole hog onto that side of things and not being able to balance with a sense of, per, you know, perspective. Um, but we'll see. I mean, if I'm reading that correctly, um, yeah, Sabres and Utopias. So I, I was really happy to find that. Sometimes when you're browsing on Book Outlet, some of these things just kind of come into your range of vision. And, uh, and they're only there for like a minute sometimes. Especially if they have like a little sticker that says low stock and there's like one or two left. You got to jump on that pony right then and there. Okay, so I want to make 2022 a year of some historical fiction. Like uh, I, I bought a bunch of books, I think, in one of my last, not my last video, but from a few months ago, I showed you a bunch of the Edward Rutherford historical fictions, like set around a major city or... or um, country. I mean, he, he's written like London, Paris, New York. Uh, there was a couple more. Was it Dublin? I think he did one in Dublin. Um, anyway, I kind of want to dive into those. 
and then I saw this one, and I was reading reviews about it. I went elsewhere and was looking up more information on this. This is a big honker of a uh, best-selling novel, almost a thousand pages. That I think back in the what is it came out in the eighties, I think, or no? Did it come out sooner than that? I thought it was a really old book. Well, you tell me. Um, it doesn't say. It says that this version is 2003. This is Shantaram by Gregory David Roberts. Um, all of, And it's, it's a big, luscious novel set in India. And I really liked this paperback edition. Nice and sturdy. There's our author there. Um... So it just has blurb after blurb here. I don't have an actual, like, description. It's just all blurbs. Um, it says here, copyright 2003. I could have sworn that this was older. But maybe not. Um, <sighs> trying to get to the first page here. Let's see. Um, well, let's just read a little bit about the author. I've never heard of him before, but he's Gregory David Roberts. Like the hero of his novel, spent many years as a fugitive. That gives you an insight into what this is about. In 1978, after his divorce, losing custody of his daughter, and being convicted of a series of robberies committed to support his heroin habit, he was jailed in an Australian maximum security prison and sentenced to 19 years. In 1980, he escaped over the prison's front wall and for the next 10 years eluded authorities living in New Zealand, Asia, Africa, and Europe but for most of that time in Bombay, where he established, which is now known as Mumbai, where he established a free medical clinic for slum dwellers and worked as a counterfeiter, smuggler, gun runner, and street soldier for the Bombay Mafia. He was finally captured in Germany and served out his sentence there and in Australia, during which time he wrote Shantaram. He is now a full-time writer and lives in Bombay. Wow, so this, <laughs> this guy's had quite the life, and he's just, like, living it. Good for you, sir. As long as you've served your time and writing novels. Okay, so it's a you know a big sprawling novel having to do with a, a fugitive from the law, probably it sounds like. But uh, I, the description that I read at the time looked really good. So, but I want to make I really want to I'm really looking forward to diving in and losing myself in some really huge, uh, big historical novels uh, in 2022. Um, also on my list is to start the Ken Follett, uh, the Edges, not the, is it the Empire series? Well, it's the one that begins with, um, oh, it's in the bedroom. I, I can see it now. It's the one that and Bill Rutenberg has been recommending it. A couple of other folks in BookTube have recommended it. Oh, I think Summer from um, Quaker Cats. I'm missing a part of that. <laughs> Channel name. Summer's not making as many videos. We miss you, Summer. And I need to start reading a buddy read with Summer uh, Dissolution by C.J. Sansom. Don't think I've forgotten, Summer. I have not forgotten. We are going to read it. Um, and in fact, I think spring or summer might be the best time. <laughs> summer, summer. <laughs> anyway, uh, so Shantaram. Okay, so, so this one was uh, kind of a, a whim. I, you know, when I saw that it was on Book Outlet and it was marked down, I think I had read reviews about this author in uh, either the New York Review of Books or the TLS, Times Literary Supplement. But this sounded really, really good. Again, it goes back to like Latin America writing or that, you know, that whole kind of um, magic realism type of stuff and that... Uh, I really kind of wanted to check out, and this is more of a contemporary writer, so this is Things We Lost in the Fire, Stories, by Mariana Enriquez. She also wrote The Dangers of Sleeping in Bed, I think, which I also want to get. Uh, but I got an, a sweet little hardcover. Uh, I don't have the price list of what I paid, but um, I th you know, if it was Book Outlet, it was in my price range, which was, you know, if it's less than $10, I really, really like it. If it's less than 5 Cha-ching! <laughs> I don't even have to think about it. Um, so it says here, a wildly imaginative collection of macabre tales set in contemporary Argentina. 
International bestseller Mar Mariana Enriquez makes her English language debut with these unsettling, si slyly funny and strange stories in the tradition of Shirley Jackson and Julio Cortazar. Set against the backdrop of Argentina's troubled history, the characters in these tales find themselves in ordinary situations that take sudden and dark turns. During a government-enforced blackout, three friends distract themselves with drugs and pain, loyal to the awful end. A young girl with nothing to lose steps into an abandoned house and never comes back out. A group of women begin to set themselves on fire to protest domestic violence. But alongside the black magic and disturbing disappearances, these stories are fueled by compassion for the vulnerabilities of the frightened and the lost, ultimately bringing these characters, mothers and daughters, husbands and wives, into a stark and known reality. Written in hypnotic prose that gives grace to the grotesque, Things We Lost in the Fire is a powerful exploration of what happens when our darkest desires are left to roam unchecked. So just a little book of short stories, um, which sounds like they're going to kind of leave an impact. You know, they're going to be quite um, probably dark. I'm guessing pretty dark and disturbing. Whoa, I almost dropped it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, one more work of fiction and the rest is history. History for my peoples. Stay with me out there. I've got some history. Well, this one is historical fiction and this is mega history. Love the cover. I, I'm pretty sure I might have read this when I was really young in my 20s. I don't remember. I don't think I did, but there is this, a beautiful edition on Book Outlet, and I had to have it. So what could this be? We're going to go Civil War. Civil War. Look at this. Ugh, look at this. Andersonville, 60th Anniversary Edition by McKinley Cantor. Um, and it's the Pulitzer Prize winning Civil War novel, but look at that cover, and it's the 60th anniversary edition. Nice, big, oversized um, paperback put out by Plume. Um, it's just it's just massive. Nice, big a novel on Andersonville, and if you know anything about Civil War, Andersonville was a prison camp, uh, I think in Georgia, where Union prisoners were held, and uh, there was overcrowding. There was no proper uh, water source. Sewage flowed right through the middle. They were exposed. They had no shelter. They were starving. Uh, the pictures of their liberation. Uh, when Sherman's troops made it through Georgia, uh, you know, they took pictures of some of the men who were just skeletal. I mean, it was very, um, it's like a forerunner to, it was a Holocaust in that camp, basically. Uh, so this one, this novel here, this big chunkster is going to, you know, talk about that in very graphic detail, I'm sure, here. Um, so let me read to you, if you've never heard of this book by McKinley Cantor. Widely regarded as the most powerful novel ever written about our nation's bloodiest conflict, McKinley Cantor's best-selling Andersonville vividly portrays the notorious Confederate prisoner of war camp where 50,000 Union soldiers were held captive and 14,000 died under inhumane conditions. Based on 25 years of research, Cantor's Pulitzer Prize-winning masterpiece tells the interweaving stories of camp prisoners, commanders, nearby planners and families, and roving bandits, pieced together by the brutal struggle between North and South. This is the inspiring, unforgettable story of the Civil War and of America itself. So I uh, was really pleased to find this just hanging out there on Book Outlet. I don't think they had many it's crisp, brand new. Uh, I don't think they had many copies left. Snapped it up. That's what you got to do. Um, all right, then we're going to go to... Ooh, we'll save that one for last. All right. I've been meaning to get this. And uh, it's a little, again, a, a neat little Harper Perennial paperback. I'm really liking these Harper Perennial paperbacks. Uh, I've got a few in the uh, the first video as well. This was marked as a notable book of the year by the New York Times Book Review. Um, so this came out. There goes my phone, people checking in. Um, this came out in 2011. This is The Last Crusade. The Epic Voyages of Vasco da Gama. 
by Nigel Cliff. It was previously published as Holy War, um, which I, I never had, so I, I don't think I've bought a duplicate by any means. Um, and there's our author. Sorry about the glare. So let me read this to you. In, in 1498, a young captain named Vasco da Gama sailed from Portugal, circumnavigated Africa, crossed the Indian Ocean, and discovered the sea route to the Indies, and with it, access to the fabled wealth of the East. It was the longest voyage ever undertaken at that time. With blood-red crusader crosses emblazoned on their sails, the explorers arrived in the heart of the Muslim East in an era when the old hostilities between Christianity and Islam had risen to a new level of intensity. In two voyages that spanned six years, da Gama would fight a running sea battle that would ultimately change the fate of three continents. Um, the Last Crusade is an epic tale of spies, intrigue, and treachery, of bravado, brink brinkmanship, and confused, often comical collisions between cultures, offering a surprising new interpretation of the broad sweep of history. So, again, just a little uh, Harper Perennial soft cover. Um, it's about $5, and uh, I picked it up. Nice color inserts there. Uh, so we got that. Okay, so we got these done over here. Then we move over to Vikings, and this is a beautiful Penguin Classics, or a Penguin. This is like the old style Penguin Classics with the nice orange spine. Um, but this came up, it's slightly bent, but on the cover, but it's not a big deal for me. This is Viking Age Iceland by Jesse Bayok. Let's see, there's that trademark orange spine by Penguin. Uh, it says here, the popular image of the Viking Age is a time of warlords and marauding bands pillaging their way along the shores of nor northern Europe. Yet, as Jesse Bayok reveals in this deeply fascinating and important history, the society founded by Norsemen in Iceland was far from this picture. Uh, it was, in fact, an independent, almost republican free state without warlords or kings. Honor was crucial in a world which sounds almost utopian today. In Jesse Bayok's words, it was like a great village, a self-governing community of settlers who adapted to Iceland's harsh, clim clima sorry, harsh climate and landscape, creating their own society. Combining history and anthropology, this remarkable study explores in rich detail all aspects of Viking Age life, feasting, farming, and battling with the elements, the power of chieftains and the church, Marriage, the role of women in kinship. It shows us how law courts, which favored compromise over violence, often prevented disputes over land, livestock, or insults from becoming blood feud. In Iceland, we can see a prototype democracy in action, which thrived for 300 years until it came under the control of the King of Norway in the 1260s. This was a unique time in history, which has long perplexed historians and archaeologists, and which provides us today with fundamental insights into sometimes forgotten aspects of Western society. By interweaving his own original and innovative research with masterly interpretations of the old Icelandic sagas, Jesse Bayok brilliantly brings it to life. So, there it is. I was really happy to find that. All right, the last two. Let's see, we're doing okay on time here. Oh, I've got so many things to show you guys. <laughs> um, okay, so this, this book keeps coming up. And actually, I, I saw that he recently, he has a brand new book out. And I think that one is like kind of like the sequel to this. I don't think it's said in so many words, but I think it is. Um, but this is War at the End of the World. Douglas MacArthur and the Forgotten Fight for New Guinea, 1942 to 1945, by James P. Duffy. Uh, this one is put out by Caliber. Um, again, there's a new book out by James P. Duffy, if you don't mind my me looking this up real quick. Um, I like reading about what's his face. Douglas MacArthur, even though he's kind of a a pill. Um, yeah, so this book was written in 2016. Okay, and I, I'm only now getting hold of it. Um, and I'll read to you what this one covers. But this, the new one that's out is called Return to Victory, 
MacArthur's epic liberation of the Philippines. Um, so, yeah, I think this is a, it's a standalone, but it might, I mean, I mean, I think it naturally follows on, you know, to this book. Uh, so let me go ahead and uh, read a little bit of this to you. A harrowing account of an epic yet nearly forgotten battle of World War II, General Douglas MacArthur's four-year assault on the Pacific War's most hostile battleground, the mountainous jungle-cloaked island of New Guinea. One American soldier called it a green hell on earth. Monsoon-soaked wilderness, debilitating heat, impassable mountains, torrential rivers, and disease-infested swamps. New Guinea was a battleground far deadlier than the most fanatical of enemy troops. Japanese forces, numbering some 600,000 men, began landing in January 1942, determined to seize the island as a cornerstone of the Empire's strategy to knock Australia out of the war. Allied Commander-in-Chief General Douglas MacArthur committed 340,000 Americans, as well as tens of thousands of Australian, Dutch, and New Guinea troops to retake New Guinea at all costs. What followed was a four-year campaign that involved some of the most horrific warfare in history. At first, emboldened by easy victories throughout the Pacific, the Japanese soon encountered in New Guinea a roadblock akin to the Germans' disastrous attempt to take Moscow, a catastrophic setback to their war machine. For the Americans, victory in New Guinea was the first essential step in the long march toward the Japanese home islands and the ultimate destruction of Hirohito's empire. Winning the war in New Guinea was of critical importance to MacArthur. His avowed, I shall return to the Philippines, could be accomplished only after taking the island. In this gripping narrative, historian James P. Duffy chronicles the most ruthless combat of the Pacific War, a fight complicated by rampant tropical disease, violent rainstorms, and unforgiving terrain that punish both Axis and Allied forces alike. Drawing on primary sources, I would hope so, uh, War at the End of the World fills in a crucial gap in the history of World War II while offering readers a narrative of the first rank. So I'm looking forward to it, and this is a nice decal-edged edition. Again, very much marked down. I mean, it's a five-year-old book, right? So... Um, Anyway, there's a brand new one out by James P. Duffy that I want to get as well. Um, uh, what I just said was, uh, what was it? <laughs> Return to Victory. His Epic Liberation of the Philippines. That's the one that I'd like to get um, after this. Okay, so the final work of fiction. This book wasn't on the listing for very long a book outlet it said low stock there was like one left and i knew that someone was going to snap it up i showed you in a, my last video on my history used book haul how i picked up the three volume set of uh, douglas southall freeman's lee's lieutenants and as we know Doug douglas southall freeman you know wrote the hero worshiping biography on lee he did these lieutenants, but he also did a biography, which was also a, I'm pretty sure this is a hero worshiping <laughs> biography, but I, I guess it's considered a classic and I haven't read it. And it's a pristine soft cover edition of his Washington. Douglas Southall Freeman with a new introduction by Mike, Michael Kamen. And I wonder if he's the one that wrote the book on the uh, Michael Kamen. I think he wrote a book about the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, revisiting it. Uh, anyway, um, maybe I'm wrong on that. This is afterward by Dumas. Oh, and Dumas Malone. I think Dumas Malone, didn't he write um, multi-volume biography on Thomas Jefferson? Okay, so we got a lot of good stuff here, but look at this bad boy. Big. This is Touchstone. Simon and Schuster edition. Just, you know, Wow. This thing is massive. Just has a remainder mark. Doesn't bother me. But just like, you know, it is brand new. Just nice and crisp. Um, just beautiful. Just beautiful. Uh, I'm trying to remember what I paid for it, but I think it was probably like $8, um, $9. It's a big work. So, I, you know, it's not going to be just $4. So. I got it. It says here, Washington is the most complete, definitive, one-volume biography of George Washington ever written. Well, 
1948, renowned biographer and military historian Douglas Southall Freeman won his second Pulitzer Prize for his new and dramatic re-examination of George Washington. For years, biographies had gone from idolatry to muckraking in their depictions of the somewhat marbleized founding father. So- somewhat. <laughs> Freeman's new interpretation was a fresh step, making Washington a living, breathing individual, flawed but heroic. An able commander who defeated the British Empire against incredible odds. Washington proved to be just as adept at wielding political power and adroitly steered our new loosely called nation through the first stormy years of our unproven federal stewardship and the first two presidential administrations. Here with an introduction by Pulitzer Prize winner Michael Kamen, who puts the writing and publication of Washington into into perspective and an afterword by Pulitzer Prize winner Dumas Malone, who explains the travails of Freeman's grinding work. Well, that's going to be fascinating. Uh, Washington is the most comprehensive biography available, and its value as an important classic has never been more evident. What even makes this more valuable is the introduction and the afterword. I'm, I'm, I might just want to jump ahead <laughs> to read the afterword by Dumas Malone, because I'm always intrigued by the writing process, like what it takes out of a historian to write something like this, like just, you know, the inside baseball type of look of, of writing this. I thought I just hit the pause button. That's why you saw this look of sheer terror on my face just in that second. And I was like, please, please don't hit anything. Um, yeah, I love it. So between the introduction, nice big meaty introduction, and then the the standard classic, Washington, Douglas Southall Freeman. So now I have Lee's Lieutenants, got the Washington. I don't have the Lee biography just because I don't think I could stand reading it, frankly. The one I'm looking forward to reading is uh, with Bill Rutenberg is the new, the new Lee biography by Alan Gelso the gentleman who wrote Gettysburg, among other really fantastic um, entries into the Civil War field. Um, What else has Freeman done? But these were the ones I wanted, really, was the Washington biography and then the unabridged three-volume set of Lee's lieutenants. Those are the ones that interest me the most. Um, So this one was abridged in 1968 by Scribner's Sons. Um, Michael Kamen wrote the introduction in 1992, and it says here that the afterword was written in 1954. So, but it kind of, it, you know, it includes them all together in, the, in this particular volume. So that's it, guys. I think that, that, that that's going to be my last uh, book haul. I had a 4.15 on a Friday, New Year's Eve here in Westminster, Colorado. Um... Let me know what you think of these books. I got quite a bit. I hope that you, uh, you know, you enjoyed part one. Um, I'm going to make a quick video after this. I might load the special New Year's message. I might post that one first. But anyway, uh, you've got pretty much an hour's worth of book haul video here between these two parts. So I hope you enjoyed. I will be back. I will have a first of the year book haul. They are sitting right over here looking at me. So, you know. Don't be sad. This is really not the end. You know, the last book haul of 2021 is really, it's only the beginning. It's the beginning of 2022. So many more books to come. And uh, books I need to talk to you about. I have read so many this last month and a half. And I haven't even told you about, I've been busy writing book reviews, but I will probably do a wrap up on things I've been reading as well. Okay, so my phone's blowing up. I could take that as my... uh, my cue to go. Um, I'll see you next year. Book two. Take care. Bye.